This is the Voice of Russia. The London Bureau of the Voice of Russia is now live on digital radio and online. For news, comment and debate, tune in on weekdays between 3 and 7 p.m. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate, and today I'm asking why are people from certain countries more charitable than others? The latest World Giving Index, published by the charity's Aid Foundation, surveys nearly 200,000 people in 153 countries and asks them whether they had given money to charity, volunteered or helped a stranger over a period of a month. The results show that almost a third of the world's population had given money to charity, a fifth had volunteered and almost half had helped a stranger. Major developing economies such as China and India rank among the least altruistic countries. The United Kingdom ranks as the fifth most charitable nation in the world, while Russia lingers in 14th place from the bottom. But some of the world's poorest places like Laos, Sri Lanka and Turkmenistan all rank inside the top 20 most charitable nations. So why are some countries more charitable than others? Today I'm joined in the studio by Richard Harrison, Director of Research at the Charities Aid Foundation. Foundation, Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and Dr. Catherine Walker, Head of Research at the Directory of Social Change and an author of several books on charity and aid. So thank you all for coming. Richard Harrison, uh, you helped compile the reports. Um, so I'd first like to ask you to explain how the World Giving Index study is collated. First of all, there's a lot of discussion around how generous people are in every country. And so there was a need, we felt, to try and produce something that put things into context. Now, ideally, you'd have really thorough, locally grounded, complex surveys, but that would cost millions and millions of pounds. Um, we saw an opportunity to work with an existing project, actually at Gallup, do a global survey for the United Nations and World Bank about the state of society, and a few questions on there about uh, generosity. So we took them and, and initi enabled an initial view on how generous countries are by looking at the proportion of people who every month give to charity, volunteer, help a stranger. We combine those three and, and produce a picture. It's not perfect, but we say it's more than indicative. In terms of helping a stranger, I mean, like I help women who've got, you know, young children in their, in, with their pushchairs, I carry a, that up the stairs. Does that count or does it need to be something of, of a greater magnitude than that? Well, the truth is that you know, when you're doing something like this worldwide, you, you have to sort of arrive at a simple set of words that you know will work globally so you can say the question is consistent around the world and, and, and that's what happened here. So people will decide for themselves what that means. But that measure is the one that uh, is, is most prominent around the world. And what you see from the research is that in the countries that are less able to give to charity, there is a, a far higher proportion of people who are um, finding another way, such as helping a stranger, to give back and, and volunteering are somewhat in the middle. So. In a nutshell, the report shows that countries around the world, uh, you know, are all trying really hard to, you know, to contribute. Their, their publics are, are trying to do that. Um, so for some, it's easier than others to, to do that through through money. But a lot's been made of, of China and India being, you know, major economic powers or developing into into those sorts of things, and and maybe not faring so well in this index. Um, on the other hand, there's uh, countries like Laos, Sri Lanka, Turkmenistan, as we've we mentioned. They rank pretty high in the list, top 20. Um, why are these less developed countries so high up, Dr. Catherine Walker? You know, this, it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint specific reasons for things like this. Um, obviously, there were 153 countries in that survey, um, and you know, it's impossible to kind of look at the specific reasons for every country. Um, but certainly, I think in Laos, uh, I think a lot of it was um, religious giving uh, from memory. And some, some of the less developed countries will have a sort of high proportion of religious giving and a, a kind of culture of helping people, whereas the more developed economies might, you know, might be better at giving money. 
Um, it was interesting. I was reading a report on um, on this on this index and uh, about India, and it mm. said that uh, lots of there was a big focus on religious giving rather than philanthropic giving. Will people be less philanthropic than uh, giving and donating uh, uh, for a religious cause? There is, yeah, there is a difference. I mean, most religions have giving as part of their kind of uh, pillars. You know, one of their pillars is is giving. Um, now that will be felt by people as a duty. Whereas philanthropic giving will be me totally voluntarily giving to something that I feel a personal, um, I feel is a, a, a cause close to my heart. So there is a big difference between them and you can see that in, uh, in the giving index, I think. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate and today I'm asking why are people from certain countries more charitable than others? Today I'm joined in the studio by Richard Harrison, Director of Research at the Charities Aid Foundation, Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and Dr Catherine Walker, Head of Research at the Directory of Social Change and an author of several books on charity and aid. Dr. Kim Scharf, I mean, do you, do you think that there's a, there's any reason why? I mean, uh, two of these countries have, um, in the top 20, uh, Sri Lanka, Sierra Leone, they've recently been in a civil war. Do you think that's had a part to play anything, any kind of internal problems that's helped them to kind of become more generous? Gosh, I wouldn't even know where to begin to answer that question because um, I don't know how civil conflict would actually affect charity and I don't know anybody that actually would. Um, what I could say is that from an economics perspective, if we just look at the survey in total, um, one thing I was interested about was how low Russia came out in uh, on these numbers. I don't know what number it was. It was quite it was far 14th down. 14th from the bottom. Which is quite, quite mm. far down from the top. So I was thinking about what I as an economist might think of that. And um, from an economics perspective, giving is giving towards collective goods. And this might be a broader perspective than non-economists might have about giving. Collective goods for an economist are goods that have a social value which is larger than private individual values and for which markets don't provide enough, which there's market failure. So if we left the market up to its own devices, it wouldn't provide enough of these kinds of goods. If we, even strongly capitalistic countries, recognize this about this particular category of goods and there is state intervention in capitalistic countries for providing these kinds of goods. There's also private provision, which is what we think of as charity of these kinds of goods. So individuals, for some reason, come and make contributions. And this isn't public provision, and it's not market provision. It's something special, and it's broader. And it's broader than non-economists might think of it. And so I suspect these numbers, which are taking into account individual giving or individual volunteering activities, might not capture the whole story. So again, thinking about Russia, because this is after all called the voice of Russia, there's a lot of company giving in Russia, where companies since um, Perestroika and the fall of co the communist regime have actually had to take over the role of the state in local communities where they have their factories. I don't know if the numbers quite are right. actually taking... They, they, they don't, you're quite right. They don't take these into account. So it, I suspect Russia might be a more generous place than the numbers suggest. And I don't know anything about Sri Lanka and the civil war and the conflict and how that relates to charity. I mean, you mentioned state intervention. Do you, I mean, China also ranked incredibly low in this index. Yeah. Uh, would, would you advocate some form of state intervention for these countries to try and... A again, so from an economics point of view, there's a presumption of failure of markets when we talk about collective goods and the provision of these collective goods. And there is a tradition in capitalist countries of private provision. And the motives and the reasons for why this might be the case aren't well known. We don't know why people give. At least economists don't know why people give. There could be lots of reasons. There could be purely altruistic reasons. There could be reasons of empathy. There could be more selfish reasons. People might give because they want to show off. They want to signal something about themselves to other types. They might do it for business reasons. We're not really sure. But what economists do know is that incentives matter for giving. So people react to changes in the price of giving. And people view, economists also know that in countries where there's a large state sector doing the provision of public goods and services, there's less charity. That is, there seems to be evidence that there's crowd out of 
private provision for public provision. So if we see China, which has this huge state sector, I'm not too surprised that we don't see much charitable activity going on at the individual and voluntary level. N Russia, again, I mean, presumably 100% of GDP was devoted to uh, collective provision of public goods and service, and there was probably no role for charity, and it was probably be viewed very suspiciously. Another, another of the things about Russia and the, the pattern of giving in Russia is that the, the sort of wealth post the communist era um, isn't sort of equally spread amongst the population. It's, it's obviously um, concentrated in the cities and amongst a smaller group of individuals. Uh, I'm thinking Roman Abramovich as a, you know, an extreme example. So when you take a sample of the population, you know, the, a random sample, you're obviously going to get a lower proportion of giving because you're not going to hit on those richer individuals. So again, you know, in Russia, the, the case is probably that the charity giving is different. You have some individuals at the top giving an awful lot, whereas the majority of the population aren't for, you know, for very many reasons, including income. Um, can I just interrupt here? Course, and, and because that's, that's, I think, also an important point, um, even coming from an economist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Charities Aid Foundation um, actually found that in Russia, in, I'm, I'm not 100% clear about the numbers, but in their, you know, at the turn of, the cent of this century and the millennium, in the 2000 to 2003, there were 36 billionaires in Russia <laughs> controlling 24% of the income and 30 of them living in uh, Moscow. So clearly, um, these people matter, and historically as well, because history matters quite a bit. There hasn't been a middle class in Russia. And so when we talk about, we talk about giving in capitalist countries in the Western world, we think about individuals who, you know, wealthy people give, but then the middle classes give, and poor people give. So should there be an incentive or an onus on them to, to give more money? Uh, well, it, it, again, voluntary giving is, is voluntary, not coercive. Uh, coercive giving is called taxation, um, and voluntary giving is called charity, charitable giving. So, so we would like to make that distinction, first of all. There might in Russia possibly be um, a quasi-form of voluntary contributions, which is uh, quasi-coercive. Uh, giving where, where you're expected to actually make contributions and I, I don't know if these kinds of things go on. Uh, middle class giving in Russia is a bit like, um, I was looking at some numbers before I came, a bit like um, I was a bit looking at these numbers and um, you know at Alton Towers here in the England they have a, a ride called Rita Queen of Speed which goes from 0 to 60 miles per hour in under no, not 0.5 seconds or something. So middle class giving in Russia is a bit like that. It went from 0 uh, to hundreds of millions of rubles in under 30 years. And so, you know, we don't really know um, where it's going to go and how incentives can be actually created to enhance it. Do you think the same would apply to countries such as India and China as well? I mean, is Well, again, we're talking about countries that don't really have a middle class. We have haves and we have have-nots in those countries. And I think, as Catherine and, and, and Richard were saying, that a lot of giving and charitable activities takes place at the community, family, um, family level, and people within communities take care of themselves, and either through the church or through strong community structures. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quite interested um, to see uh, two countries that are struggling economically, shall we say, at the moment, um, at polar opposites of the, of the table. Ireland in third place, world giving index store of 56%, whereas the other end, uh, Greece is fifth uh, from bottom uh, with just 14%. Does, does, does the economy affect a country in terms of charitable giving? Richard Harrison. Well, I, I think in order to really answer that question properly, we'd, we'd need to put the, the right data in, 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 in the hands of people like Catherine and Kim. Uh, and unfortunately, we haven't yet got governments around the world committing to proper surveys that get the total value of giving, which is, I think, one of the numbers you need to answer that in each country. We have it in the UK, we have it in the US. Um, but short of having that, one can only speculate. I mean, when we put these reports out, um, people talk about any number of, of reasons why people might be higher up or further down. You know, the economy is certainly one of them. Let me reel off a few others that I've heard mentioned over the, over the years. Uh, Work-life balance. You know, Canada's up there as well near Ireland. You know, is it is it a situation where places where the, you know, a combination of economy, you know, nice places to go, um, you know, things to see do well? Is it a question of um, government support? You know, we talked about China and India earlier. I remember when I lived in China, I would do focus groups with people around charity. It wouldn't mean anything because 
um, partly because life was too hand to mouth, but partly because the government's policy at the time was that it could do everything and charities weren't needed because that would be, well, the, you know, the inference is that it would be embarrassing to them. So there's, there's, there's the need for government support. And here in the UK, we have gift aid and many other measures that help to make charity a centrepiece of civil society. But then there's um, you know, history as well. Maybe the most remarkable, important year for uh, charity in Russia was this year, perhaps with the tax changes. Maybe in the UK, it was in the 17th century when the Elizabethan poor laws uh, came into being. So, sorry to evade your question, but you know, there's there's probably a half dozen, you know, uh, slippery subjects, and and you know, we as researchers probably hope that in 10 or 20 years from now, the answer to that question will be a bit more sort of substantial. But I think, you know, really our responsibility to now is say a lot more has to happen at government levels to buy into um, proper data sets to to answer those sorts of questions properly. Would you agree with that, Dr. Kim, Kim Schaff? Uh, well, I'm all for collecting evidence because I don't, I, I, we don't know anything really about what motivates giving. And economics is all about trying to develop stylized um, frameworks which would allow us to actually make predictions about things. So uh, I don't think many people, you know, economists have fallen into a bit of disrespect lately because of, you know, we've failed to predict, predict the... Uh, financial crisis and the ensuing economic recession. But, you know, we do have what we can bring to the table is um, the tools and the frameworks that can be used to generate predictions about things. And then if those predictions actually stand up to scrutiny depends on the available evidence. And we do not have a lot of evidence about what goes on with respect to how people decide why, what, and where they're going to channel their money. I'd like to focus on, on the United Kingdom. We haven't talked about that that much. Um, we, we're always quite, I think we, we blow our, our own trumpets in the UK a bit with, in terms of charitable giving. It, it springs up quite a lot in the news, a fair amount. But um, is there an incentive that we should be doing more? Dr. Catherine Walker. 56% um, of the, the UK population give at the moment. Um, and it, it is an interesting question because we're, we're often torn, I think, between saying how generous we are as a nation and, and sort of applauding the generosity of, of the public and kind of thinking, do you know what, 56%, that's not really good enough. Um, so I, I, it comes back slightly to what Kim said earlier, giving is voluntary. Um, it should come from the heart. You should not be exhorted to do it. But sometimes I think perhaps you need reminding to do it. Um, and you see that in, uh, you know, disaster campaigns, um, hum humanitarian crises. You see when people are reminded to give, reminded that other people in the world are a lot less well off than they are, then people give from their heart. But it's, you, so you might see a spike in giving around a, a humanitarian crisis, but that's then not carried on. People kind of forget about it after that and go back into their, their old habits. So it's, I don't know, it's a tricky question. Should, should people give more? Let me just go back to um, what Sir Kim brought up earlier. State inter intervention, would you be an advocate of that at all? State intervention in what way? In terms of, well, forcing people to be more generous. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. No, because as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's voluntary. That's, that's the absolute essence of charity. You, you, you force people to volunteer or force them to give or force them to help a stranger and you'll see we'll all turn into a, a, a nation of mean, horrible people. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate, and today I'm asking why are people from certain countries more charitable than others? Today I'm joined in the studio by Richard Harrison, Director of Research at the Charities Aid Foundation, Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and Dr Catherine Walker, Head of Research at the Directory of Social Change and an author of several books on charity and aid. Looking at the at the bottom countries, I mean, you've got Ukraine and you've got um, Lithuania, Romania, Russia, all countries part of the former Soviet Union. We, we've kind of dabbled on, in, on the idea that perhaps in Russia during the Soviet Union, it, it wasn't really the voluntary giving wasn't really the done thing. Perhaps is, is the well. I would say it wasn't um, done at all because the communist regime was supposed to take care of all of everybody's uh, needs and all the welfare needs of the peoples. So is it just a question? I mean, uh, take, take for example in Britain, there's the mm. Salvation Army or the Poor mm. Laws. Hundred years ago, 
is it just a question of historically there's well okay so I have a view on that which is um, Richard brought up the poor laws and um, uh, if you look actually at Russia and at England and Wales in the 17th century they don't look dissimilar from each other um, charity charities have always been granted special privileges in England and Wales and exemptions. And the reason that they've been granted those is that there's been an acknowledgement that if these um, organizations or, or churches or communities didn't actually do the provision, then the state would have to step in and spend the money. So historically in England and Wales, there's been a recognition that charitable goods and services are full or partial substitutes for public provision. And I think that's very important. And that's the rationale, I, I think, for allowing charities to have special privileges and exemptions in the first place. When taxation was introduced, charities were exempt from taxation, for instance. Why do we offer tax incentives to giving on the part of individuals who are not charities is um, there's there's great debate about the reasons for that it's because we we want to offer those if we believe that we should have a society which has a lot of charity and so those incentives make it easier for people to give and so if we have them then we'll enhance the amount of charity in society um, obviously these things are costly to government because you can't make something cheaper for somebody by offering them a tax deduction unless you're paying through with for that through lost revenue. So an efficiency argument for giving these tax incentives is that the um, you give a dollar or a pound to somebody um, so that they can contribute to charity cheaper and that's going to result in more charity. So it's a cost effective way for government to actually raise the amount of charitable goods and services in the economy. Is that always going to be the case? That depends on whether you give a dollar worth of tax deduction and get a dollar back in charitable goods and services or more than a dollar or less than a dollar. And the measure that economists use for determining that is called the price elasticity of giving and unfortunately that, that has tended to be all over the place. We're not really sure what it is anymore. Um, so there's arguments for and against tax incentives for giving, um, but there's no argument in my mind at all that charity, charities and charitable goods and services are providing things that the government would otherwise have to step in and do themselves. Richard, well, I mean, tax incentives for charities in, in maybe some of these less well-performing nations, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing to say is if the net result of clever use of the tax system is that you know, a, a, a more harmonious society with fewer sick fewer elderly without the care that they need etc then then it's worth looking at and, and and you know it's worked very well in countries that have more sophisticated societies so uh yeah a, a big yes i mean there's a favorite expression of mine which is you can lead a horse water you can't make it drink and i think we wouldn't be shouldn't be looking to as you know you, you raised the question playfully earlier force people to do things but there's a lot of clever ways we can make giving easier to do, whether it's making Apple agree that they should allow giving to charity through the App Store, you know, common sense, down-to-earth, modern lifestyle, digital things. There's a lot of things we can do that in, in, in the back end, like we can stop slowing down charities, even in countries like the UK, by making them fill out lots and lots of paper that, that they shouldn't be. That, that, you know, there's also a policy level and sort of innovation level there's things that we can be offering um, for people to uh, evolve how they give that haven't yet been brought to life here but have in other parts of the world. So, for example, in Canada, Kim will know a lot about lifetime legacies. That basically, you go from a, a, a psychology where once you're dead, you can give, which doesn't give you a lot of fun because you're dead, but to a point where in, the Canada, in Canada, you can begin to benefit, be part of that passing over of money in your latter years and, and that's one of the things that you know we feel we you know one can bring to the uk but certainly for countries that are low down the index that probably have further to go in civil society building tax incentives you know is a, is a is a is a big opportunity in terms of getting the ball rolling and dr Catherine walker tax incentives main way to go or would you suggest uh, other no not, not necessarily the main way to go but obviously um a very effective way to go and gift aid um is one of the things that we're concentrating on at the moment trying to make that easier for um charities and individuals alike um i think uh, richard was referring to online 
you know, trying to get gift aid online to make it a lot easier and, you know, lessen the paperwork. Um, so tax incentives are definitely a part of the um, the artillery that we should be using to, to encourage more giving. But there are lots of, lots of other ways to do that. Um, I mean, I think at the moment some people are looking at um, behavioural economics um, and philanthropic psychology, as Adrian Sargent calls it, uh, which is basically ways of um, looking at the psychology of how people make decisions and applying that to the way that we ask people. Because uh, generally, uh, one of the number one motivations for people giving to charity is that they were asked. And if you ask them in the right way, that will enable them to give more. It'll, it'll sort of nudge them. It's kind of nudge this nudge stuff. It'll nudge them into, into thinking more about giving and to, and to perhaps giving more. I wonder if that in, in includes stopping somebody on the street. I'm not sure if people are too keen on chuggers. They're getting a bit of a the, bad name people these days. Are, people are not too keen, but uh, the thing is, and I won't be popular amongst many people for saying this, it works. And if it didn't work, it wouldn't be there. Um, I, I spent some time working as a telephone fundraiser for, for a number of charities. And for every one person who slams the phone down on you, nine people say, oh, yeah, do you know what? I haven't increased my direct debit for, you know, well, since I took it out two years ago. If you hadn't reminded me that the cause is still there, that they, need, that they in fact need my help more now, I wouldn't have thought to raise it. Uh, what about, uh, just a final point, advocating people to really d directly get involved, you know, work for the Samaritans or go out and, and, and help people who've been affected by floods in Pakistan, for example. I'm actively going out. I know it's quite, that's quite a sort of a cavalier way to, to, to be charitable, but would that not be rather than just giving money to charity yeah, definitely definitely money's not the only way people can people can give to charity i think the giving index shows that clearly and you know helping a stranger uh, which is just basically being a nice person you know that's being charitable but yeah volunteering formal volunteering go join the samaritans definitely um perhaps you know going to help flood victims in pakistan you'd probably need some training uh, uh, but you know look at things like the peace corps um there's all sorts of ways that you can actually get involved um, whether you want to stay in your armchair or actually, you know, get out there and go to Pakistan. Yeah, definitely. OK, well, I think that's a, a good place to stop. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate, and today I've been hosting a discussion to find out why are people from certain countries more charitable than others? I've been joined in the studio by Richard Harrison, Director of Research at Charities Aid Foundation, Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and Dr Catherine Walker, Head of Research at the Directory of Social Change and an author of several books on charity and aid. Tomorrow, my weekly sports discussion show Sports Talk returns for the first time since the Olympics, Paralympics and the Euro 2012 Football Championships. I'll be looking, I'll be previewing this weekend's sporting events, including the Singapore Grand Prix, discussing homophobia in football and looking ahead to the Sochi 2014 Winter Olympics. Stay tuned, the news is up next. Listening to the voice of Russia from the heart of London. On weekdays, we broadcast live from 3 p.m. until 7. We'll bring you news, current affairs, features, and debate. You can listen to us on digital radio and online. Visit ruvr.co.uk. This is the voice of Russia. The London Bureau of the Voice of Russia is now live on digital radio and online. For news, comment and debate, tune in on weekdays between 3 and 7 p.m. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate and today I'm asking why are people from certain countries more charitable than others? Every country. And so there was a need, we felt, to try and produce something that put things into context. Now ideally you'd have really thorough, locally grounded, complex surveys, but that would cost millions and millions of pounds. 
Um, we saw an opportunity to work with an existing project, actually at Gallup, do a global survey for the United Nations and World Bank about the state of society, and a few questions on there about uh, generosity. So we took them and, and init enabled an initial view on how generous countries are by looking at the proportion of people who every month give to charity, volunteer, help a stranger. We combine those three and, and produce a picture. It's not perfect, but we'd say it's more than indicative. In terms of helping a stranger, I mean, like I help women who've got you know young children in their in, with their push chairs I carry a, that up the stairs does that count or does it need to be something of, of a greater magnitude than that well, the truth is that you know, when you're doing something like this worldwide you, you have to sort of arrive at a simple set of words that you know will work globally so you can say the question is consistent around the world and, and, and that's what happened here so people will decide for themselves what that means but that measure is the one that uh, is, is most prominent around the world. And what you see from the research is that in the countries that are less able to give to charity, there is a, a far higher proportion of people who are um, finding another way, such as helping a stranger, to give back and, and volunteering are somewhat in the middle. So, in a the latest World Giving Index, published by the charity's Aid Foundation, surveys nearly 200,000 people in 153 countries and asks them whether they had given money to charity, volunteered or helped a stranger over a period of a month. The results show that almost a third of the world's population had given money to charity, a fifth had volunteered and almost half had helped a stranger. Major developing economies such as China and India rank among the least altruistic countries. The United Kingdom ranks as the fifth most charitable nation in the world, while Russia lingers in 14th place from the bottom. But some of the world's poorest places like Laos, Sri Lanka and Turkmenistan all rank inside the top 20 most charitable nations. So why are some countries more charitable than others? Today I'm joined in the studio by Richard Harrison, Director of Research at the Charities Aid Foundation, Professor Kimberly Scharf, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and Dr Catherine Walker, Head of Research at the Directory of Social Change and an author of several books on charity and aid. So thank you all for coming. Richard Harrison, uh, you helped compile the reports. Um, so I'd first like to ask you to explain how the World Giving Index study is collated. First of all, there's a lot of discussion around how generous people are. 